Church, last Sunday, I, I preached the first of a two-part sermon series on glorifying God during this pandemic, because glorifying God by proclaiming the gospel, making disciples, and treasuring Christ above all is our church's mission. And as I said last Sunday, this current pandemic does not change our church's mission. In fact, I believe that God has and God will give us unique opportunities. I'm already hearing about some of these opportunities to glorify him by proclaiming the gospel, making disciples, and treasuring Christ above all. So my aim this morning is the same as it was last Sunday. I want to use this sermon to help lead our church towards accomplishing our mission by considering five biblical ways that we can glorify God during this pandemic. Now, I spent the majority of last week's sermon on the first two ways that we can glorify God, and, and that is by being prayerful, praying, communing with God, seeking after God in prayer, and by being faithful, that is, trusting in the Lord through this pandemic. Not turning our backs on him, but obeying the scriptures, seeking to glorify him, trusting him through this. And this morning, I will address, address the other three ways that I mentioned last week that we can glorify God. And that is by being evangelistic, by being wise, and by loving others well. Now, I'm going to change the order, though, and I'm going to address evangelism last. It can be easy for us, church, to lose our focus during a season like this. It's easy to be distracted. We have new schedules. People keep on saying they're getting used to this new normal. I'm not sure that I'm used to this new normal yet. I don't really want to get used to this new normal. I want to be with you. I want you in this sanctuary. If you're part of our church, I wanna see you singing praise to God. I wanna pray with you in person. I wanna preach again to a room full of people, not to empty chairs minus five or six people. And so I don't wanna get used to this new normal. It's not, it's not going to last. It's not going to last. And so uh, I, I want to, in this time, to, to help refocus, to cut through some of that distraction. And, and if you're discouraged, I want to encourage you as you walk through this season with us, and we walk through it with you. Christian, the Lord has saved you for his glory. He's not saved you just so that when you die, you can go to heaven. He has not saved you so that you can just get through this pandemic and then after this pandemic begin to serve the Lord. He has saved you for his glory in all seasons and he will use this season in your life, Christian, to bring glory to his name. If you're part of this church, he's brought you to this church. He's brought you into fellowship with the believers in this church as a member of this church or maybe you're a recent attender before this pandemic happened, you just started coming to this church. Well, he's brought you to this church to glorify God. That's the mission, church. And it has not changed. And so that's why I want to spend these two first live stream sermons reminding you of the mission and encouraging you, exhorting you to continue to seek to fulfill the mission. Next week, we're going, we're going to be returning to the series that we were in before all this, and that is our series through the Gospel of Luke. We've been going through it verse by verse, uh, expositionally preaching through uh, the book of, of Luke, and we're going to return to that next Sunday. Obviously, we'll be talking and making some connections and talking about the relevance of that passage each Sunday to what we're facing as a church. Uh, but I want to spend one more sermon this morning uh, to to remind you of the mission and encourage you, church, to continue to seek to accomplish the mission. And so with this in mind, uh, again, I, I'm not going to have just one main text. I've, I've chosen three, one for each of these things that I'm exhorting, these biblical things that I'm exhorting you to do. And so we'll, we'll quickly work through some of these things. And I, I really want to be practical. I really want to give you some tangible ways that you can glorify God, even if you're, if you're not able to leave the home right now. And so that's my aim this morning. And before we begin, please go with me to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, there is none like you. Oh, how good it is to know you, Lord, always. Sometimes we, we think we're, we're stronger than we are. And, and this season has humbled so many of us. We are all, we are all in need of your grace and your goodness. We are all, Father, in need of your help. And so I pray, Lord, that, that you would give us your help, that you would remind us of who you are in this season, that, that we would seek after your face, 
that we would delight in you, our God, who does not change, though our circumstances change, though seasons change, though, though our lives will change, you do not change. And may we take heart in that reality that you are the God who does not change, who is always just as sovereign as he was the day before, who is just as great and glorious and worthy of praise as he was before all of this. May you increase our passion and our love for you, our desire for you, our great God. We give you thanks this morning for your provision, that you have given us food. You have continued to put air into our lungs. You have kept our hearts beating. You have allowed us to hear your word and to sing your word and, and to, even if we can't gather, to, to hear your word preached. You have given us people to love and things to do. We thank you, God, for all that you are doing and, and you have done for us. And Lord, we, we pray. We pray for wisdom. We pray that you would give wisdom to our president and our governor. We, we pray that you would give wisdom to our leaders, to, to those making decisions in, in our church and, and those making decisions in our local community who are seeking to, to care for and, and to love others and, and trying to make some decisions that are hard at times. I know there is a spectrum of, of belief on what we should be doing as a nation and what people throughout this world should be doing, and, and I'm okay with that. And yet as a Christian, I believe that, that the government that you have put over us and those leaders that you have called us to submit to, you're working through, and, and even through their failures and, and decisions that they're making that are not wise, you will be glorified. And so help us to navigate that as a church, to continue to pray for wisdom, whether we align with a certain leader politically or we're in disagreement with another brother or sister in Christ over what they think the nation and, and people in this world should be doing. Help us, we pray, Lord, to, to continue to pray for wisdom for us and, and for, for others. We ask, Lord, that you would protect doctors and nurses and first responders, the elderly, the young among us, uh, those who are especially weaker in body and who are already fighting various sicknesses, maybe battling cancer and other diseases. Lord, be with them, we pray. Strengthen them and use them for your glory, especially those doctors and nurses, first responders, and, and those who are working in, in fields and places that, that we're so reliant on as far as our, our needs and, and having provision and being cared for. We pray uh, for the, the members in our church who are in these fields especially. Lord, be with the doctors in our church. Lord, we pray that you'd be with the nurses. We pray that you'd be with, with those who are serving others and, and at times uh, in, in various uh, risk of picking up not just the coronavirus, but, but other viruses and diseases. Use their skills and their abilities, their minds, and, and the, the wisdom that you've given them when it comes to caring for others. And we pray that you would protect them. And Lord, now we pray that as we, as we consider the, the needs in our church, that, that you would be with those who are grieving. I know of a family that has, has lost a, a loved one, a son. We pray for this family. God, please be their comfort and their peace, their hope and their encouragement. I believe they're, they're looking to Christ through this, this great season of loss and, and mourning that they have not lost hope, and I pray that you would sustain them as they grieve and they mourn. Or there are others in our church who are struggling, who are suffering as well. May you be their comfort and their hope and their peace, their strength, and even their joy in their time of sorrow. And now, Lord, we need to hear from you. People do not need to hear from me. They need to hear from you. And so I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word, that you would do what only you can do with it. Nourish hearts. Grant repentance and faith where there is not repentance and faith. Care for your people. Draw more and more non-Christians to you. Regenerate their hearts. Open their eyes. Give them, them ears to hear the, the precious gospel. Give them new hearts that beat for Jesus. Do all this for your glory and the joy of your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I will begin with, with this encouragement and how you can glorify God, church, by being wise. You can glorify God during this pandemic by being wise. And, and I, I think 
Ephesians 5, 15 through 21 is a good passage for us to read and have in mind when it comes to, to being wise. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Christian, no matter the time period, whether it's the first or the second century or the 21st century, no matter our situation, whether we are under the rule of the Roman Empire or under the rule of a safer at home policy, there are ways to be unwise and there are ways for us to be wise. There are ways for us to waste our time and there are ways to redeem the time that the Lord entrusts to us. We are called always to worship and to treasure the Lord Jesus Christ. We are always to be doing what he has told us to do. His revealed will is found in his word. In this passage, through Paul, God calls out the sin of drunkenness, telling us not to fill ourselves with wine, but, but it, could, it could be easily said beer. Don't fill yourself with beer or booze. Don't get drunk. Instead, we are to be filled with the Spirit. Now, this is not, not a call for, for us to be pursuing spiritual emotionalism, to pursue some spiritual experience as an escape, like the drunk escapes with alcohol. This is a call, church, for us to worship God. And we, we are to be doing this by being in his word, sharing his word with one another, singing God's praise, giving God thanks, and seeking to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. What should you be doing if you want to be wise during this time? Worship God. Really complicated, isn't it? New information. It's not new. Same thing you should be doing all the time. Worship God, Christian. Not all, but many of us find ourselves with more time on our hands. And those of us who, who do are to be wise with how we spend this time that God has given to us. It would not be wise to spend this time getting drunk. And I think most Christians would quickly acknowledge that, that drunkenness is a sin and so we shouldn't get drunk. But there are so many other ways to waste our time in this season. I'll just give you a few. It would be unwise and a waste of time to spend your days in fear, Christian. You know the Lord. You believe the gospel. Not only do you know where you're going when you leave this world, whether it's because of the coronavirus or because of old age, you know him now and he is with you now. And you believe him. Though you have not seen him, you trust him. So don't live in fear, Christian. That would be a waste of time. You will battle anxiety, and we talked about that last week. One of the ways that you battle through anxiety and, and fear is by praying, by bringing your cares to the Lord and trusting that, that he will bring you through them, that he will be your delight and sustain you. So that would be a waste of, of your time if you just live at home in fear through this pandemic. Here's a, another way that, that you can waste your time, by binge-watching TV, by finding all that you can in, in, in other shows that are, on your streaming device and just hunkering down on the couch, grabbing a blanket, never coming out of your pajamas and just watching TV or movies or, or even the news all day long. I, I would encourage you not to do that, church. Is it sinful to, to watch a show or a movie or, or check the news during this time? No, that's not what I'm saying, Christian. But if you are spending your day in fear or you're laying on the couch or in bed binge watching TV shows and, and watching movies over and over again and all you do is consume your mind with news, bad news from the news that you're watching, this will not lead you to worship God. So what you, should you be doing instead? Commune with God in prayer. Worship him in song. Read and study his word more than you normally would be able to do because your job or your career or other responsibilities don't, don't allow you to have as much time to do these things. 
take advantage if you have more time during this. Not everybody does, but if you have more time, take advantage of this to draw near to the Lord. I do not believe that this is a vacation church or a staycation. This is not the Lord giving us a break from following Christ. If God has cleared more of your schedule, it's not so that you can be unwise, lazy, get drunk, and waste the day. That's not it. Remember, COVID-19 is not sovereign. The Lord God, our God, is sovereign over all, and that all includes this pandemic. And God has purposes in your life and the life of others for this pandemic. And, and though we don't know all those purposes, he hasn't given us the detailed plan for how he's going to use this pandemic to bring glory to his name and, and to refine and strengthen his church. We don't know all these things. God doesn't have to give us the answer or answer to us on these things. Still, I'm quite confident that God's desire is not that you would be unwise and waste this time, but that you would use this time to glorify him, to draw near to him in prayer, to worship him in song. We have been blessed already before this pandemic with so many good theological resources. We can download many of them right to our phones or our computers. We have access to so many God-centered sermons from faithful preachers of God's word. We, we have so many theologically rich worship songs at our fingertips that we can listen to all day. So many books are, are available to us that can increase our knowledge of God, not just so that we would learn more about God, but so that we would be better equipped to glorify him and, and would fuel us to worship God. The more you know about God, the more, if you know him truly, you want to worship God because you know he's worthy of every single thing that you can give to him. I want to direct you again to our resource page on our website. There's, it's not a long list of, of resources. We've tried to keep it short, but we're going to be growing that list in the coming weeks and encouraging you to, to use those resources. You'll find not only our sermons there, but recommended resources, preachers, books, and ministries that will serve you well during this time and always. Many of these ministries during this pandemic have, have discounted the, the price of their resources so that people can use them them and others like Ligonier, one that we, uh, a ministry that we use for discipleship, they've given complete access to their teaching for free during this time. Christian, glorify God during this pandemic by not wasting your time, but by worshiping God, by using these things, by praying more, by reading the scriptures, by reading the, the word, digging into a good theological book. So that's the first thing I want to encourage you in this sermon to do. Be wise. Use this time well. The second way that you can glorify God during this pandemic is by loving others. 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Loved. Let us love one another. For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. There are so many ways to love others during this pandemic. Now, I do believe that John's focus mainly, specifically, is on the church loving one another. But I do believe that, that there are plenty of other passages, and, and he wouldn't exclude this, that, that we are also to love others outside of the church, whether they be other Christians outside of our church or in our community, people that are not Christians. Even if you can't leave your home, or the people that you are seeking to love can't leave their home, there are so many ways that you can love people. And we Christians are to love one another well. And others, well, because God loved us first by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to be the propitiation for our sins. That is, in Christ, not only has God made atonement for our sins, we're not just at a level of zero and then we improve upon that. Because Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, we have the favor of God upon us. We cannot improve our standing with God. His favor is being poured out. His love is on us. 
And so what does that now do for the Christian? It fuels us to love one another and others. God loves us perfectly and completely, freeing us up from having to focus on loving ourselves because he loves us better than we could ever love ourselves. And now we can love others more than we ever did before. I want to encourage you, Christian, to look for ways to love the people in your church during this season. The people in your family, in your community, your neighbors, co-workers, doctors, nurses, mail carriers, and delivery drivers, grocery store workers. Now, you, you may have to be creative on how you do it, and there are so many ideas. I thought of just giving a list, but that, that would take another five or ten minutes, and I, and I don't want to do that. So instead, Google it. How can I love people well? And, and, and use them, these ideas. Talk to other Christians who you know are loving people well. Get some ideas on, on how you can love well to the glory of God. Look especially for ways to love the most vulnerable and needy among us, whether that's the elderly, the poor, the sick, or the homeless. Again, there's so many ministries that are in need of help right now that, that care for the poor in our city, who, who, like the rescue mission, the Milwaukee Rescue Mission, may be lacking resources, and so contact them. We don't need to organize all this as a church. The Lord will lead you, and I'll give you some ideas. Call the, the Milwaukee Rescue Mission. Look for ministries that, that are in need of help, whether that be financial help or, or you're healthy and you're strong and, and it, it, it's, it's wise for you to be one of those who can step into the, the void that's been left because others have had to step out of ways of serving. Now, again, we may need to be creative, but, but this is the time to take great steps and make changes in our schedule and our priorities to love others well. I have already heard some wonderful stories about how some of you are seeking to love people. I've experienced some of that love. Uh, people have, have baked cookies to encourage, to support, and, and to just show a little bit of love to, to people in our church. They've given financial gifts to somebody that they know. Maybe they're a small business owner, or they're going through a, a hardship financially, and, or, or they've lost their job. Brother, sister in Christ. You have opportunities. You're commanded by your Savior who loved you perfectly and loves you perfectly to love your brothers and your sisters in Christ. There's so many ways to do this. Love people well. So I want to encourage those of you who are loving well to keep doing it. And I want to challenge you, church, to show your love for one another and others more and more. I do believe that this is one of those unique ways that God's people can especially glorify God in this pandemic. We are not to, to face this pandemic like the world. Those who do not trust in Christ face this pandemic. We're not to be hoarders of our goods. We're to be generous with what God has entrusted. Wise, again, but generous. Seeking to, to, to love and care for those who who need our love and care and concern. May we be a bright light in a dark world during this season. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And if we do this more and more, God will be glorified in and through us, church. This brings us to a third and the final way that I want to encourage you to glorify God during this pandemic, and that is by being evangelistic. And I moved it from the third to the fifth to last in the sermon because it's the one that, that I'm going to spend the most time on and the one that I want to leave you with. I want this to linger in your mind. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Evangelism, that is telling people who are not Christians about who Jesus is and what Jesus did, was a priority in the life of our church before this pandemic, and it will be a priority in the life of this church after this pandemic. Which is why the very first phrase in our mission statement after we glorify God by is proclaiming the gospel. Now we believe that the good news about Jesus Christ, the gospel, is to be proclaimed to everyone. 
to both the Christian and the non-Christian because we all always need to hear the gospel. We never outgrow our need for who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us. Christian, you and I need Jesus today just as much as we did the very moment we first repented of our sins and trusted in Jesus. I need him just as much as I did 17 years ago or so when I first trusted in Christ. And now I know even more my need for Jesus today than I did back then. And yet a major part of what it means to proclaim the gospel is to be evangelistic which is telling people who are not Christians, whether they be atheists or Jews or Muslims or Buddhists or Hindus or agnostic, whatever they might be, about Jesus, who he is and what he has done, and calling them to respond to Jesus by repenting of their sins and trusting in him alone. We are to be, church, ambassadors for Christ. That's the language the Apostle Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. Christian, during this pandemic, you are to be an ambassador for Christ. That is your mission. You're an ambassador for Christ during this pandemic, a representative of the King of Kings and his unshakable kingdom, even while you currently live in a world that is being shaken by this virus. You and I are to tell others about the sovereign Lord, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God who was slain to atone for his people's sin and was bodily raised from the dead to, to defeat death and secure eternal life for all who trust in him. It is a privilege to be an ambassador for Christ. It is an honor to represent Jesus in this world. This is not merely a duty. It is to be a delight church. And as ambassadors who are to share the king's good news, the gospel during this pandemic, it's important that we not only speak, open our mouths, send emails and texts and do video conferencing or however we can speak the truth about Christ to people. It's important that we speak rightly about Jesus and his gospel. This means, Christian, as a representative of Christ, who God is using to make his appeal through, you don't have the authority to edit, to leave out, to add to, and, and, and even soften God's message. It is God's message. It is God's good news. It is God's gospel. How foolish it would be to think that we can improve upon God's message. God doesn't call us to be his editors. We're not to be his editors. He's called us to be his ambassadors. And ambassadors, at least the good ones, they don't just speak on behalf of someone. They faithfully and clearly deliver the message that they've been told to share with others. For us Christians, that message is the gospel. The good news about Jesus, that God has made a way for sinners. Sinners like us, sinners like you, to be reconciled to a holy God. And if we can be reconciled to God, by God, that means that we need to be reconciled to God, by God. That there is no other way. This is the bad news that's made clear throughout the pages of the Bible. We are sinners, and sin has separated us from God. We need to be reconciled to God. As Romans 3.23 puts it, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 tells us that, the result of our sin, the consequence of our sin, what sin pays is death. A death that is both physical and spiritual. Because of our sin, we will die. And because of our sin, we are and we will be separated from God. His love. Instead of experiencing his love, we will experience his wrath for eternity. If we're going to be good ambassadors, church, we need to be clear on the bad news so that we can be clear on the good news. People need to hear about this bad news. Sinners need to understand this bad news, that no matter how nice they are, no matter how much we love them, no matter how many gloves or masks or supplies they donate during this pandemic, and no matter how much money or food they give away, these are all good things to do in this time, whether you're a Christian or not Christian, but these, these things will not atone for their sin. The non-Christian the one who does not trust in Christ is an enemy of God. 
Their sin is a rejection of God. They have broken his law. They are in rebellion against his right to rule. And sin is, is no little thing. Whether it be the sin of using God's name in vain, worshiping another God, be it Allah, the God of money, the God of career, or the God of sports. Whether that sin be one lie or a thousand lies. Whether it, be, whether it be stealing a pack of gum or stealing a car, coveting, lusting, adultery, sexual immorality, hatred, racism, or murder, all sin is wicked. And no sin is little because that sin is committed against a great and glorious sinless God, the God who made and will judge all of us. And so even just one sin is worthy of condemnation. God's eternal wrath is in hell. And all of us have sinned more times than we know and more times than we can count by the things that we've done and the things that we have not done. It is having an understanding of this bad news and our desperate need to be reconciled to God that helps people understand how good Jesus and his gospel is. This pandemic is serious. People have and more people will lose their jobs. People in our church have been laid off. They're not sure how they're going to be paying their rent or their mortgage. People have, have started to lose a portion of their retirement. Sometimes it's been significant portions of their retirement. People may lose their houses. Many people will, will and already have gotten sick, and some of them will die because of this virus. But the non-Christian's greatest problem is not COVID-19. It is that they are a sinner separated from God. And because of their sin, God's wrath will be poured out on them now and forever. People are, are really adamant about, you know, spreading the news about what this virus can do. People are all over social media on Facebook, changing how they're living their lives because they are concerned and I think rightfully so for, for, this, for this virus and, and what it can cause in, in this world. What about sin? That is the greater fear that people should have. And ultimately a fear of God is what people need to have. This virus will take people out. They will leave this world on, a, on an earthly side of things because of this virus. And what will happen after that? Well, they will be judged by holy God. And that will be their biggest, greatest problem ever. That is the bad news that people need to know about and hear about, church. And this brings us to 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I believe that this is a summary of the good news that we are to be sharing with others as ambassadors for Christ. The only way that sinners can be reconciled to God is by God. For our sake, God the Father made his son, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, that is, he was sinless. God made him to be sin for us. This is a reference to the atonement when Jesus Christ bore the righteous wrath of God that we deserve to, to bear in our place on the cross. And God did this. God the Father made Jesus to be sin for our sake. And Jesus Christ willingly became our substitute, dying in our place, atoning for our sin, so that in him, in Jesus Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. That's a great summary of the heart of the gospel. There's more that could be said there's more that should be said in conversations about Christ and about what God calls his people to do and be. But, but that, at, at bare minimum, these things need to be said. Jesus, the righteous one, died for us who were unrighteous to make us righteous so that we could be reconciled to a righteous, holy God. This has been described by theologians as the great exchange. The righteous one bears the wrath for us who are unrighteous. And now God declares us righteous. And who gets the glory? 
God gets the glory. And so as we believe that, as we affirm that, as we proclaim that church, God is glorified because we're talking about him and what he has done to save sinners. And not only that, but people are hearing the gospel. And some of the people who will hear the gospel, even during this pandemic, will turn from their sin, repent, and trust in Jesus Christ. And that will glorify God. Do you want to glorify God? I want to glorify God. And be evangelistic. Share the gospel. I do believe that, that sharing the gospel includes calling people to respond to the gospel. Calling people to repent of their sin and to trust in Christ alone. Not in their good deeds. Not mixing a little bit of grace or half grace and half works. No, it's grace alone. Grace alone saves sinners all for God's glory. So we, we must, church, call people to repent. This is not just another news. This is not an, a, another update. This is God's good news for sinners. True repentance and saving faith are gifts from God. Repentance is not just admitting that you, you've sinned or, or even feeling bad about your sin. It's turning away from sin. Having the desire now to not sin. It, it, it's a new taste in your mouth. That taste is, is I want to spit sin out. I used to love it, now I hate it. That's what comes with true repentance. It, it doesn't mean that the repentant person won't sin anymore. They will. They will still sin after they repent and continue to repent. What it does mean is that they don't want to sin. But the Bible says that, that God has given them a new heart, new passions, a new desire. The, the language that we've used in our mission statement is, is a new treasure. And that treasure is Christ. That's, that's, that's their, their taste now. That's what they long for. That's what they desire now the most is, is Jesus. And saving faith has nothing to do with being a perfect person. It has everything to do with knowing you are a sinner and trusting only in who the Bible says Jesus is and what the Bible says Jesus did. That he is God the Son who became a man, that he lived a sinless life and he died to pay for your sin and he was raised from the dead bodily, defeating death and securing your salvation. Those who repent and trust in Christ are justified by God's grace through faith in Jesus and, and they will now seek to follow Jesus and glorify God. And one of the ways that they will seek to do that is by sharing the gospel because Jesus commanded his disciples to proclaim the gospel, to make disciples, to tell people about him and what he's done for sinners. And so getting practical here, or trying to get practical, how can we share the gospel and call people to respond to the gospel when we're being told to minimize our in-person interactions and practice social distancing? Well, again, I'm just going to give you some ideas. Run with them, come up with your own. I encourage you to, to, to begin by considering your own relationships and situation and do whatever you can to be evangelistic during this pandemic. As I've said before, oftentimes evangelism takes time. It's many conversations. Sometimes you only have one opportunity. They're a stranger. You're, you're never going to see them again. If you're in the store, and, and maybe now you're, you're at the end of the aisle and they're at the other end of the aisle and, and you're acknowledging them and, and there's a connection. And, and, and in that moment, all you have is that one chance to share the gospel. Then yes, of course, if you can, if you're bold, if you believe the Lord's leading you and, and you want to glorify God, then share the gospel. Be clear. Tell them about God. Tell them about man, that the man is a sinner. Tell them about Jesus and call them to repent and trust in him. But that's not probably going to happen for most of us, although I encourage you, if the Lord gives you that opportunity to take it, think big picture, think long term, try every conversation to get a little bit further on the gospel. Maybe you're able to, in an extended conversation, share all of it, but, but maybe not, and that's okay. As ambassadors, we don't have the right to mess with the gospel, but I do believe that God gives us freedom when it comes to how we are to share the gospel. And if you're talking to a family member, a friend, a coworker, your, your neighbor, you're probably going to have more opportunities to share the gospel with them. It's a conversation. And so whether it's with, with a phone call or, or by, by talking to your neighbor from six feet or more away, whether it's a video conference, an email, a letter, or through a text, 
We may be bound to our houses, but the gospel is not bound. I, I would encourage you to read the Bible with somebody over the phone. Ask them, hey, would you, you, you've got extra time. Maybe this is a, a grandparent, uh, a friend, and they're bored. And they've said, you know, there's nothing to do. They've been complaining to you about, about how they've, they've done the binge watching. They, they, there's no more shows. They're, they're watching, you know, the terrible shows now. They have nothing, nothing to do. Well, what can you do? Say, I, I hear that. I hear you've got nothing. Here's what I, I would love to do with you. Would you read the gospel of Mark with me? And let's talk about Christianity. You, you said already you have nothing to do. Well, well let's, let's do something. Let's get into the word. I, I've mentioned already how there, there are so many ministries like Ligonier that have made their resources free. Uh, Ligonier has a, a, a way that you can study through a, a, one of their studies uh, as a group. And so you can start a, a Bible study with Ligonier, connect, go on there, sign up, it's free, and then ask five or six or even just one person to do that study with you. And there, there's quizzes and, and there's a way that you can interact with one another. Take advantage of that. Be creative. I do believe that it's good, though it's often the hardest for us to start with the people closest to us and then move outwards from there. Are you married? Well, this might be a great time if, if your spouse is not a Christian to share the gospel with them again. Sit them down and say, hey, let's just read the Bible. I know, I know you think I'm a fool. I know you think I'm crazy for trusting in Jesus and living my life for his glory, but Let's just read the Bible and talk about Jesus and, and the gospel. You have an adult child who lives at home or, or is home from college. Maybe, maybe you have young children. What, what should you be doing? Share the gospel with them. I, I know so many parents of young children who wish they had more time. And now they're saying, I, I wish they were in school or I, I wish they were on their, their regular routine. Well, God has given you this time, parent, whether your children are young or older, to, to get into some family worship routines, to adjust your schedule. And maybe this will be the new norm even after this pandemic. What a great opportunity to press the gospel further into the, the lives and the hearts, hopefully, of your children. God has cleared more of your family schedule with this Safer at Home order, and I encourage you to redeem the time by making gospel conversations a greater priority. Sit down with your children and go over the gospel. Use a book, use a, a good gospel tract, find an app, do something to share the gospel with your children. Or maybe you're a child, a, a young or, or adult child, and, and now you're home. If you're young, you're probably home already and you were home then. But if you're home from college, you're home and, and you've got parents, one or both. Maybe they're not, they're not Christians. You're not confident that they, they know Christ. What about your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers? Be intentional. Look for opportunities. Whether you're, uh, you're home alone, there's nobody else in your apartment or your house, or you've got a lot of people around you, look for opportunities to share the gospel. Christian, you know the one who conquered death and grants eternal life. It, it might be, uh, the, the opportunity is, is that they're discontent, that they're bored. Christian, you know the only one who all people were made to worship and the only one who satisfies the human soul. Will you not make an effort to tell them about Jesus, the discontent? You know the only one who, who brings contentment, Christ. Or maybe it's, it's loneliness, hopelessness. Or, or that someone's longing for love and you know it. Well, you know the God who is near and present. You know the God who is the only one to hope and, in and, and the God who loves us. And so point this person to Christ. Be an ambassador. Sinners need to be forgiven of their sin and reconciled to God. They need the gospel. I want to especially encourage you, those who, who, are, who are trying so hard. Maybe you're discouraged. You've shared the gospel with your grandparents. You've shared the gospel with your spouse. You've shared the gospel with your neighbor. You've shared the gospel with your children, and they reject it. Pray. Pray for more opportunities. Ask God to help you, to give you wisdom. Here, here's another practical thing that I, I would encourage you to do. 
ask questions about what they believe and why they believe it. Maybe you're stuck. Just ask them questions. It's a great way to start a conversation. You're you're not trying to sell them something. Jesus doesn't need to be sold. He's God. You're not trying to make a deal with them. You're not You're not asking them to try something. Jesus is not a sample to be tried. You're not even even in need of arguing with them. That's not what you need to be doing. You're an ambassador for Christ who is sharing his message of good news. When I'm in a conversation with somebody, I will often ask someone I'm seeking to share the gospel with this question. What do you think is the main message of Christianity? I think it's a great question. It's, it's really just asking, what, what do you think the gospel is? What's the main message? What's the heart of the Christian message? What's the gospel? And so often the answer I'm given in response to this question is something like, be good and do good. Be good and do good. Or treat others the way that you want to be treated. And, and Christian, don't be discouraged if that's the answer that's coming out of grandma or grandpa's mouth. The, the answer that your spouse gives you, your friend, your neighbor, your child, don't be discouraged because, because that is a great opportunity to share the gospel. You can say something like this. The good news of Christianity is not that we are to be good and to do good or that we're to treat others the way that we want to be treated. The good news is that though we can't be good enough or do a, a, a good enough job for, for God, for the God who made us, And though we have not treated others the way that we have wanted to be treated, God has made a way for us to be reconciled to him and to one another. And that way is through Jesus. The heart of the gospel is not be good and do good. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. The heart of the gospel is you failed. You're a sinner. You deserve God's wrath. And yet God, for his glory, out of love, and in his grace has made a way for you to be forgiven, sinner. Ask questions. Ask them to share with you what they think the heart of the gospel, the Christian message is. Christian evangelism is almost always difficult. But the goal, the mission during this pandemic is not to avoid difficulty. It's to glorify God. You're an ambassador for Christ. And there are many important and helpful messages being shared during this pandemic from many people like politicians and physicians. But the responsibility that we have as Christians, as Christ's church, is to share the most important message with others during this pandemic, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our politicians will not tell people about Jesus. Most of the doctors, unless they're Christians and nurses and those caring for people's physical needs, will not tell them about Jesus. That is our task, our responsibility as ambassadors. It's the message that people need to hear from us, church. And as we implore people on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God, as people hear the gospel from us, we will glorify God because evangelism is an act of obedience that requires faith which in and of itself glorifies God. And by God's sovereign grace, let me remind you of this church, as we faithfully, clearly, boldly share the gospel, some of, some of the people that we share the gospel with, some of the people that hear about their sin and hear about Christ the Savior, some of them will repent and believe. Some will join us in worshiping King Jesus. Dwell on that today. Yes, be wise. Yes, love others. I think it is wise and loving to share the gospel. But church, I especially exhort, encourage, plead with you to be evangelistic. Share the gospel. Let's pray. God, you alone save sinners. And yet you have chosen to use your church to be ambassadors for Christ, to implore those who are not yet reconciled to you, a holy God, to repent and to believe in your Son, the only Savior of sinners, who though he knew no sin, became sin for us. You made him sin for us. You poured out your wrath on him for us so that we would become the righteousness of God. 
May we believe this glorious gospel and may we proclaim this glorious gospel. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.